good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in from around the world as we continue with our epic Hope for Wildlife series here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. My name is Jesse, I am your virtual adventure guide, and if you are joining us for the first time, and a lot of you are today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today is particularly special because we are continuing, as I said, with our Hope for Wildlife extravaganza. If you didn't get the chance to tune in yesterday, it was for the birds as we talked with penguin researcher Grant Humphreys and Claudia Hermes talking about saving condors. It has been an amazing opportunity to bring together this series, providing inspiring optimistic stories of the incredible people working to conserve and save species and habitats around the globe. So this would not have been possible without the green status of species team at the IUCN Red List and without the incredible folks at Conservation Optimism. This entire Hope for Wildlife extravaganza has been made possible by the Nature for All global network of nature education and conservation groups, so a big kudos to them as well. Now before we get underway with today's topics, I do want to note that we have a Kahoot for you guys. So if you're live with us, if you're on YouTube, you want to chime in with Kahoot.it in a separate tab, we're going to do a quick four question quiz between the talk and the Q&A today, so please do feel free to join us for that. Now for today's topic to kick us off we are doing predators today later on we've got merlin van weird and crocodiles but we're starting off with university of cambridge marine biologist dr julia spett she is joining us in the united arab emirates today where she's going to talk about hope for sharks these incredible unbelievable creatures that dominate our oceans uh, and are so integral to so many amazing food webs across this planet they're much maligned a lot of people have Quite a few misconceptions about sharks but all the more reason to share how incredible they are and some of the amazing work being done to protect them so without further ado i'm going to turn it over to julia to blow our minds on the world of sharks julia thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the broadcast thank you for having me jesse i'm really excited to hear that so many of you are interested in sharks and want to learn more and maybe even share your own stories about sharks I can't see you, unfortunately, but um, if you have any questions after the talk, please um, send me an email or send me a message on Twitter. I'm always happy to chat about sharks, to hear about your favorite species or answer any questions. And I'm sure many of you are already shark experts. So I want to start this talk with a question to all of you. Mm. Does anyone know how many species of sharks, how many different kinds of sharks researchers have discovered so far? How many do we think are out there? Okay, I'm any gonna turn it, turn it to a few classes and see if anyone has any thoughts. So Ms. Corbett's yep. class, what do you guys think? How many kinds of shark are there in the world? Uh, uh, 20, a lot. I heard 20 and I heard 25,000, very different. How about Mr. Ann's class? We got some hands up, what do you guys think? Say it. 25, 503, 25, going once, all these different answers. I like this diversity. Julie, I think one of those is pretty oh. close to our correct answer. Yeah, did, did someone just say 503? Yes. That is actually pretty close. So at the moment, we have found around five, sorry, 540 different species of sharks. But as we develop new methods to examine the deep seas or find methods to distinguish between sharks that look very much alike but are genetically different, there will be more shark species um, discovered over the years. So as you grow older, this number will very likely rise. And what I find really fascinating is how different these shark species look. I mean, some of them look like the normal shark you would imagine or we would draw if someone asked you to draw a shark, but some of them look really funny. Some look really scary. Some don't even look like you would imagine a shark looks like. So it's not only their appearance that's different, but it's also their lifestyles. Some of these sharks live in really, really deep waters in the deep sea. Some live in shallow waters. Some live in really cold areas. Some live in really hot areas. And some feed on big seals. Some feed on microscopic, tiny planktonic organisms. So I've always found all these um, species super exciting and interesting. And there are some facts that are the same for all sharks. And I quickly want to share some of them. For example, their skin. Their skin is covered in tiny scales that are more like 
teeth than scales. So if you strike a shark in one direction, it will feel very smooth and soft. But if you strike it in the other direction, it will feel like sandpaper and it can even hurt your skin. But these scales are designed in a way that makes the shark very streamlined. And that's why it's such a good swimmer. And some people are using this design, for example, to design airplanes. Their skeleton is not made out of bone like our skeleton, but made out of cartilage, which is the stuff the tip of your nose is made of or your ears. So you can feel it's, it's quite soft and it's much lighter than bone. And that helps the shark keep buoyant in the water. They have an incredible sense of smell, much better than, for example, a dog's sense of smell. At the same time, they have this super sense um, called electros electrosense, which um, they're used by these tiny, tiny pores that are around their nose, and they're called ampullae florencini, and they are filled with a gel and allow them to detect the electric field that each animal has around it. We humans, we can't sense it at all. But these sharks, even if they were blind and couldn't smell, they would still be able to find their prey using this sense. Also, if a shark loses a, a tooth, it doesn't matter because there are several rows of teeth behind their first row. So they basically never have to brush their teeth. They don't have to worry about their teeth at all because if one falls out, the next one will just come in throughout their entire life. But what's probably the most exciting fact is that sharks are older than dinosaurs. They have been around for over 455 million years. I find that pretty amazing. And I guess, all of you have probably a favorite shark species, or if not, maybe they will discover one during this talk. But um, I have several, and I wanted to introduce some of them and tell you why I think they are especially cool. And one of them is the Greenland shark. It lives in very deep water, and it's the longest lived vertebrate on Earth. It can live for over 500 years. Imagine what kind of stories these sharks could tell us if they could speak. They could tell us exactly what the oceans looked like 500 years ago. It lives in very cold water, minus 1 to minus 10 degrees Celsius. So us humans, we can only spend a few minutes in there. And if you want to, to stay longer, we would need a dry suit. And uh, these sharks eat almost anything from polar bears to other shark species or reindeers. They mostly feed on dead animals, but they also hunt um, seals, for example. And what's to me most interesting about the species is that almost all Greenland sharks are blind. Even though they're born with a small, healthy eyes, during their lifetime, small eye-eating parasites attach to their eyes and start eating the eye tissue. So they kind of live in the eyes and eat them until the shark becomes completely blind. So how can the shark find its prey? As I said before, they have an excellent sense of smell and that's all they use to, to, find, to find their food. They don't need to see. Another shark that I really like is the whale shark, and I've spent quite a bit of time swimming and diving with them in the Red Sea. These are, even though they are the largest fish in the world, very, very calm and gentle sharks. And um, they have over 3,000 teeth, but they are tiny, smaller than six millimeters. So they're not scary at all. And even though they are so big, all they eat are tiny, tiny animals that float in the water, that, which we can't even see. We would need a microscope. And to maintain their size or grow even bigger, they need to filter around 600,000 liters of water per hour. And while they filter the water, they extract these tiny organisms and feed on them. So basically, they have to swim around all the time with their mouth wide open filtering this water. This one is, I think, a very funny shark. It's called the bearded wobbegong. 
Um, as you can see, it has um, some weird looking appendages that look like a beard. It's also called a carpet shark because it look, looks like a carpet a little bit. And this one can actually walk on land. So it sometimes stays in tight pools. And when they dry out, it uses its huge fins to walk to another tight pool. It's very well camouflaged. So it doesn't need to actively hunt for prey, but it just sits there and waits for prey to pass by. So for example, um, this fish, you can't see the shark, but now suddenly it comes out and swallows the fish whole as well as this puffer fish. It just swallows everything whole, even sometimes fish that are almost as big as the shark itself, without moving much, just sitting there and waiting for, for animals to come by. You have probably all have seen or heard about hammerhead sharks. Um, they are really cool as well, I find, because they have 360 degree vision. So imagine you could look behind yourself without even turning your head. I think that would be very, very cool. In addition, their super sense, um, I had talked about before, this electric sense is very well established in them. So they don't need to see or smell their prey. They can just use this sense to detect animals hidden in the sand and then prey on them. This one I like for several reasons. It looks very scary, I think, because it has long teeth and many rows of these teeth. But it's actually one of the calmest and most gentle sharks I've ever dived with. And it all only eats like small fishes and crabs. It's, it's not dangerous at all to us or any bigger animals. But there's still something scary about it. And this happens actually in the mother before the baby sand tiger sharks are born because embryos of this species already have quite sharp teeth and many of them. And uh, the mother has 10 embryos in each uterus on each side. But if these would grow to the full size, they need to be, to be born. There wouldn't be enough space in the mother. So, the biggest of the embryo starts eating all the other embryos until only two are left on each side of the uterus, on each in, one in each uterus, and then the mom gives birth to two very strong baby sharks. Imagine how strong they must be if they've eaten nine other sharks before they are born. And this is called sand tiger shark cannibalism. So I've always found sharks interesting, even though I'm from southern Germany, I grew up quite far from the ocean. But after finishing high school, I decided to study marine biology and move to Australia. And during the final year of my study, I got the opportunity to do a research project on sharks. And from Australia, I went to the Bahamas to a small research station that specialized in shark research. And I was doing a, a study on juvenile lemon sharks, and I learned how to capture sharks, how to keep them in captivity, how to handle them, how to tag them, and how to study their ecology. And I've studied sharks ever since. So I've um, done projects in the Bahamas, in Australia, in the Red Sea, on Cocos Island, um, which is a tiny island off Costa Rica and in French Polynesia. And what's really encouraging is that at some of these locations, you find shark populations that are still intact, where you find lots of different species in great abundance. And you can imagine that hundreds of years, this is what the oceans looked like hundreds of years ago, um, where you had plenty of sharks around everywhere. It's unfortunately not the same everywhere, but for example, at Cocos Island, um, where I've done some of my studies, if you go in the water, you will see hundreds of sharks, literally. Schools of hammerhead sharks, but also other species in, in huge numbers. The island itself is kind of looks like Jurassic Park, 
And um, it kind of is Jurassic Park because as soon as you go underwater, you see these sharks, which are older than dinosaurs. And the project I've been doing there um, also involved going into a submarine and check out what's at greater depth. So we went down to 360 meters and even there we saw schools of sharks and just a very, very healthy ecosystem. And um, my main focus there is to use um, a camera system. So you have two cameras attached to a frame and crushed up very smelly fish in front of it to attract sharks. And we use this method to figure out how many different kinds of sharks there are and how many of each kind. Because, as I said, this is um, such an intact ecosystem. So we want to know what's special about it that so many sharks can, can survive there. And um, if you put a camera down, you will see something like this. Immediately, sharks come up to the bait and try to get to it. These are Galapagos sharks. And they were quite far offshore. If um, you go closer to shore, you can see other species like these um, white tip reef sharks. They are also very eager to get to the bait. And as you can see, there's so many of them that it's kind of difficult to distinguish between them. But since we want to count them, we're using the special software which allows us to measure the sharks. And each shark has a very specific length. So we can ID them, give them different names, and then we know exactly how many sharks there are from each species. And we, we can then compare this data to other areas which unfortunately have been fished, or overfished, um, at which not that many species or sharks in general are around anymore. So I've done a very similar study in the Red Sea, for example, and the Red Sea has been fished for decades and um, not many sharks are left, which is reflected on, on these videos. I've never seen more than one single shark on, on these videos. This was a nurse shark. This is a um, juvenile zebra shark. And a lot of videos didn't show any sharks at all, but instead moray eels and moray eels usually live in caves they hide from predators like sharks and they are scared to come out they usually hunt from their cave but if you reduce sharks to a level where these moray eels don't have to be scared or worried anymore they come out swim around freely and as you can see this one is really bold trying to get to the bait and not worried about sharks at all because there are just no more sharks around in in this area and um, this is a big problem because um, even though we don't know the exact links yet, um, we know that sharks are very important for the ecosystem. They are the top predators. And if we remove them, the fish species the shark preys on will grow, like more and more of, of these fish will be around, which is a problem because they will then feed on the fish species that are smaller than them, which are below their level. These will be reduced. And these fish species, if they, for example, feed on algae, and if they are reduced to, to such a level that they can't um, keep the algae in check, algae will overgrow the reef. Um, which is a big, big problem for the entire ecosystem. So this is a very simplified um, explanation for why sharks are important. As I said, we still don't know exactly how these links work, but we do know that sharks stabilize the ecosystem. And if we remove them, then the ocean is in big, big trouble. Unfortunately, all over the world, people like to eat shark meat. And it's not only in a, a handful of countries, it's basically every single country in the world. Even in Germany, like in the supermarket, you can buy shark, but people don't even know it's shark because it's labeled with a different names, uh, with a different name. So we have to be very careful when choosing our seafood. And um, we humans, like we threaten sharks much more than they threaten us. And overfishing is still the biggest problem that people fish for sharks, either targeted or they accidentally catch them. And um, for example, 
finning is also a huge problem. Um, a lot of countries like to, to eat shark fin soup, um, but in general, like shark meat is sold almost everywhere in the world. And another problem is bycatch, where people are trying to catch other species, but sharks end up in the nets or on hooks and then die without even being eaten afterwards. Also, ghost fishing is a huge problem. That means people leave the nets they've used to fish for certain species in the ocean. They're just floating around and catch everything around them. And uh, sharks get entangled and uh, drown because basically sharks need to constantly swim um, to filter water through their gills um, to be able to breathe. Um, so if they are caught in one of these nets, they can't breathe anymore and die. Another practice um, that's very dangerous for sharks is shark finning, um, where people just cut off the dorsal fin and let the shark um, go back into the ocean, but eventually it will die because it can't swim anymore. Um, in some years, more than 100 million sharks are killed per year, um, whereas only around eight deadly shark attacks on humans happen per year. So as I said, humans are a much bigger threat to sharks than sharks are to us. Still, a lot of people are scared of sharks. And so especially in areas where there are quite, a, where there are quite um, many sharks around, like in South Africa or in Australia, where you have many white sharks close to beaches, governments have um, established a method to keep them away by using shark nets. And so they're basically designed that the shark can't enter near shore areas where people are surfing or swimming in the water. But the problem with these is, first of all, the shark can swim around the net. So it's not really um, a great protection from sharks. But what's even worse is um, that these nets catch everything that um, gets entangled in them smaller sharks, whales, dolphins, and turtles. So um, this, is, um, this is really sad, um, but some researchers in Australia, and I was part of this project, have now developed a method that um, makes it not as necessary to use these nets anymore. And um, what they use is a setup called smart drumline. So it's basically a small computer unit between two buoys. And um, so you can basically just throw it in the water. The small computer, it's called the smart, smart unit, is attached to um, a magnet. And the magnet is attached to a line, and the line is attached to a hook and a bait fish. So if, for example, a white shark goes for the fish, the magnet releases from the smart unit and sends an alert to the researcher's phone. So what we usually do is we throw out these units in the morning, go back to our office and wait for a phone call. So we get a phone call, an automatic phone call from this unit telling us exactly where a shark was caught. So we immediately jump on a boat, go to this location, secure the shark next to our boat, and put a little tag on it. And this tag sends out a specific signal for each individual shark. And this signal can be detected by, by these kind of listening stations, which have been put out all along the east coast of Australia. And each individual shark has an individual ping frequency. So we can distinguish between these sharks. So whenever a shark swims past one of these stations at 500 meter distance or less, these stations send out a signal via a phone app, which everyone can download for free, even you guys. And the user will get um, detailed information on where a shark has been detected, at what time, which shark, what species, what size, and can then decide for themselves if they still want to go to the beach or if they rather wait until the shark has left. And um, up until now, we have tagged almost 800 white sharks with these tags. 
that's almost 20% uh, of the entire population. So we know where, where these sharks are most of the time. And um, at the same time, other scientists are using drone surveys to detect sharks and will also send this information to this app to inform users. So this will help to reduce the need for nets because we now know where these sharks are and we can warn people and people can then decide, as I said, for themselves, if they still want to go to the beach or not. So this is making me hopeful that in the future, we hopefully won't need shark nets anymore at all. Um, so this is what researchers can do to protect sharks, but every single one of you can help to protect sharks as well. And as I said, one thing we should all be very careful about is choosing our seafood. We need to make sure that we're not buying shark meat accidentally or on purpose. And sometimes it's difficult. As I said, um, they use different names for sharks, but usually you can look for the Latin name on each product and then maybe Google it and see if it's maybe hidden shark you're buying. Also, a lot of people dislike sharks and uh, think they're dangerous killing machines. So if you hear people talking badly about sharks, speak out and defend them. Tell them, tell them how important they are for the ecosystem and how interesting these species really are. Start teaching others about sharks, your family, your friends, until everyone understands that we really need to protect these um, organisms and uh, need to make sure that they remain in, in our ecosystems. So yeah, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, um, yeah, if you have any questions later on, please email me. But um, yeah, Jesse, please go ahead and <laughs> let them questions or do well, the quiz. Julia, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for such a spectacular presentation. What a great deep dive into so many things about sharks, their conservation, so many incredible species. The fact that you shared a wabagong is one of my favorite things ever because there's so, so few people know about them and they're one of my favorite sharks on this planet. And the Cocos Islands are so seldom featured on our broadcast. What a special place in the world and, and lucky you for getting the chance to work there. Well, uh, before we dive in with questions, I will note that we're going to do a little kahoot together, test your understanding, see how much you guys are paying attention. Uh, yesterday's kids, I will note, did an amazing job in our Hope for Wildlife presentations. And so if you're new to kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get and you don't win anything, but you do win Julie and I's everlasting respect if you end up on the podium. So that's that's worth a lot. Um <laughs> And, uh, and then we're going to dive in with your questions. And we also do have a Padlet for all our, our quick kids after the fact, so you can share additional questions uh, unless you want to just email Julia directly and inundate her inbox. But let's get underway, folks. Uh, you guys are pouring in, which is awesome. Uh, we'll start with our first question. And Julia, if you want to help us out with hints when there's five seconds to go in each of these, by all means, give us a little pointer. All right. But we'll start with our first question, which is a quiz. How many kinds of shark are there? One kid almost yelled us out to the to the exact one earlier in the program, but is it 20, 100, a little over 500, or 10,000 kinds of sharks? This is very early on in our broadcast. We covered a lot of ground since then. Hmm, five seconds. I don't think, Definitely I don't think it was just 20. I think, you, I think you talked about just 20, Julia. Uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> maybe, but there are definitely more. Hey, almost everybody got this right. There are over 500, about 540 right now. Soaring Bunny takes our lead. Very, oh. um, could be shark food, really, is a soaring bunny. But let's go to <laughs> number two. True or false, some sharks eat each other before being yeah. born. I'm so glad this was maybe for <laughs> Junior Talk. We don't know if it's true or false yet. We've got 15 seconds to go. It's one of the freakiest things in the world. And shark reproduction in general i encourage everybody to look up shark eggs when you're done this broadcast because the shark species that do lay eggs are insanely cool and they're yeah, like, yeah. 94 of you are in let's see most of you got this right you guys are like on the yeah. i love it all right our leaderboard completely changed flying panther now in the lead okay get those questions for julia ready as well true or false sharks are older than dinosaurs that it, there's no way. I can't be right. Dinosaurs are like our go-to example of like something in the way, way distant past, right? Sure. Um, I'm going to pull up a name actually for all of you guys. Uh, shark 
from way back in the Earth's history it was called Helicoprion, and it's one of the coolest creatures ever in the world's oceans. So everybody should look up the, the name below, and most of you got this right as well. You guys are like ripping through this. Helicoprion. Amazing creature. Flying Panther keeps our lead. Prairie Shark. I think the Prairie Shark should win just because it's got shark in the name, but you have to earn it. Okay, here's the deal. <laughs> With our final question, before your questions for Julia, what are some ways that we are helping sharks? Okay. Better fishing practices. Are we tagging sharks? Are we doing acoustic tracking of them? Or for anyone who's ever joined me in a Kahoot before, maybe it's one of our last answers there. Hmm, I don't know. That's a tough question, Jesse. Three. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying we're getting them on on board with all these questions it's exciting 107 this is such a big one all of the above yes there's so many Perfect. ways you can help sharks there's so many ways in which you guys can help sharks at home too uh and i'm so glad you took the time to mention all that julia while we're waiting for our podium to come up too i encourage you if you're interested in sustainable seafood ocean wise is our canadian one and seafood watch from the monterey bay aquarium in the united states are fantastic resources to learn about sustainable seafood. So Prairie Sharks in third, Witty Piranhas in second, and Rational Possum wins. If you are any of these people, let us know who you are as we dive in with our questions. Julia, this was great. Let's dive in. Mr. Stoltman, I know you guys need to go in a few minutes, uh, and so does one of our other classes. So I'm going to head to you guys, grade fives, and Brunkin, come on in. Grady has a question. Yeah. Dave, I do. What? You're tied up in someone's Chroma. Sorry. Hey, Grady. Thank you, Ty. All good. Hi. I didn't think we were asking. Hi, my name is Grady. And how long have you been doing this for, Julia? Yeah. Oh, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. Wow. As I said, I, I started studying sharks during my undergrad studies and have never stopped since. <laughs> I mean, they're an exciting, they're a spectacular group of animals, and you've got the chance to travel all over the world and work with people, you know, some of the coolest people on the planet. So really little incentive to leave the shark world because it's so, so exciting. Yes. Good question, Grady. Uh, let's head to Miss Siegel's class, Allenby Public School. If you guys want to come on in, just unmute your mic and you are good to go. Hey, room 112. They had a question. They had a question of if Julia, Julia, have you ever, um, sorry, discovered any new species of shark? I have not discovered a new species, but I have discovered species that were new to a region. For example, in the Red Sea, I've discovered the pig eye shark, which was not known for the region before. Cool. I, I like that we got a question about finding new species too. And we've had marine biologists on who have noted that when you go to places like the deep ocean, particularly, you almost always find a new species. And I, I yes. always love highlighting this for kids that there are still ecosystems on this planet, tropical rainforest, deep sea, where if you go, you almost always find something new, which is amazing in this day and age with all the exploration we've done, that that is the case. But I hope one day we'll have you on for another broadcast in a year or so, and we'll see if you found some new species in some of these adventures you're going on. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Mr. Ann's class, come on in. Do you guys have a question for us? Hey. Yes. Okay, Perfect. has a question. <laughs> Stay in there. How big, are baby how big are baby shark when they get born? Yes. Oh, it really depends on, on the kind of shark. So some baby sharks are tiny, 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 but some, for example, the white shark babies are quite big. They are one and a half meters long, so probably your size. <laughs> that's a big baby. I always yeah. like um like blue whale babies where they're like the size of an elephant. I think that's the record in the yeah. history of the world, but very cool. I don't think we've ever had a question like that for sharks. Uh, <laughs> Let's head to Baldwinsville, New York, Miss Cottrell's class, who, by the way, came first in our Kahoot. So way to go for the fifth graders there. Wow. Congratulations. Um, hey, come on in, guys. <laughs> How much does the whale shark weigh? How much does the whale shark weigh? Oh, that's a tough yeah. question. I'm actually not sure if anyone has ever weighed a whole whale shark. Um, that would be quite difficult. Um, it's many tons, I would say. But I can't give you an exact number. Well, if, I have to look it up. if anyone would know, I know tomorrow we've got Gonzalo Arajo who's going to be joining us, and he's a whale shark <laughs> expert. So if you want to come yeah. dive in and learn all about this <laughs> creature, uh, they're they're very cool. But they are the largest fish in the ocean. They can get to be over thirty feet long. They're a spectacular animal. My favorite animal in the ocean, really, I think, is the whale shark. <laughs> very, very cool. 
All right, we're going to head to room 22 and 23 if you guys want to unmute your mic, and then we'll take a few questions from YouTube before doing another round. Come on in, guys. Hey. Have you ever seen a lemon shark? A lemon yes. shark. I've actually worked with lemon sharks um, during my undergraduate studies and during my master's. Wow. In Bimini, in the Bahamas, um, there's a nursery area for lemon sharks, which means um, they are protected in these shallow waters, protected from other sharks, and you find plenty of lemon shark babies to study. Yeah, fantastic. What are the chances? I love that. Uh, <laughs> great question, guys. All right, I'll take a few from YouTube and then we'll head back for another live round. Ms. Ribeiro's class wants to know if you have a craziest shark story, like the most incredible thing that's ever happened to you out in the water. No pressure. Mm, I, I would need to think about that. I think that's not one story that pops <laughs> up in my head. Uh, like every encounter with a shark is always amazing and exciting. Yeah. So um, this, is, this, is, this can be your future, kids. You can become a marine biologist and you have so many amazing shark stories that there's no individual one that comes to mind because your life is just wonderful. Um, if you think of any, as we go on, by all means, we can interrupt and, and answer that. But I like that. that, right. that I think so about perfect. it. Um, Miss Creases class wants to know if you've ever been bitten by a shark in any of your research, even like... I have. Yeah. I don't know if you can see that. Probably not. On my hand, um, there's a scar. Can you see yeah. that here? Yeah. Um, so I was working with um, black tip reef shark babies in French Polynesia and we were putting these little tags in them. So doing a little surgery to put these acoustic tags I've been talking about before in them. And one of the sharks got really angry with me. So as I released it, I let go and had my just left hand hanging over the water and it jumped out of the water attached to my hand and didn't let go so i kind of had to pull it down and since it was biting my hand all the skin and part of the muscle came, went down with it so i had a big wound here even though it was a tiny tiny shark about this size but it was very painful and i wasn't able to get back in the water for several months and i needed many many stitches around my hand so we have to be careful even when it's just tiny baby sharks. Well, and I really like that you mentioned earlier in the talk the fact that a shark attack risk if you're in the water is so vanishingly small. It's in the few dozens yes. of attacks and a few deaths a year on all the oceans of the world. But anytime you're working with animals, you need to respect them properly. And you can always have a situation where you're very close to teeth, that something goes wrong. I think that's our biggest animal attack story we've ever actually had on the broadcast. So wow. <laughs> maybe sure. we've, we've had, this is the thing though. And I like noting this, that biologists are really well trained. They know what they're doing. They're, you know, they're, they work with people that have done this in many cases for decades. And so the risk of having any serious injury or, or problem is very, very low, but I'm, I'm glad we finally got one of these stories in one of our programs. Um, let's head to uh, Miss Siegel's class. One more with you guys. We're going to do one more round. And I will note for all our classes that people might need to go, we are going to have a Padlet too. So a virtual whiteboard. You'll be able to share your questions after the broadcast. Now, Julia's off to bed soon because it's dark outside where she is uh, on the other side of the world. But tomorrow she'll have the chance to look at some of your questions if you have any others you'd like to share. But Miss Siegel's class, come on in and take us away. Um, have you guys ever had any big shark attacks? Big shark attacks ever in one of your dives or research program. Did you say baby or big shark attacks? No, a, a big shark attack, something like a great white or something larger. Oh, okay. No. Actually, whenever I see sharks underwater, they are more scared of me than I am of them. So <laughs> as soon as they see me, they usually turn away immediately and leave. And um, I'm sure many more sharks have seen me underwater before I've actually seen them. So they're very, very um, scared of humans usually and try to get away from you as, as soon as they can. Now, we've had um, Ripley's Aquarium in Toronto on and there's a big shark tank that people can go in and people always wonder, do the sharks come to attack you? The sharks like hide in the corner of the tank, like terrified of the people. And that is pretty much a universal in the animal kingdom. Animals will flee people. There's uh, vanishingly few exceptions to that rule. So I always love when we get that question. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ann's class, coming to you guys. Three more questions, folks. Come on in, guys. Is he, is he, is he, is he, okay, Izzy. Um, go here, go here. Oh, to the computer. What, what's the 
species of shark is the closest to being extinct? Yes, any critically endangered sharks? Oh yeah, unfortunately, many species are now endangered. Um, I don't know ex the exact number for critically endangered sharks, but seventy-five percent of all sharks are now threatened with extinction. Yeah, yeah. This is a group that's under a lot of facing a lot of threats in the oceans of the world, not least because they're persecuted for some many of the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, and so it's really important to highlight the fact that there's so much great work being done by people like you to help conserve them. Uh, so many new methods to prevent them from being caught as bycatch, prevent them from being eaten for shark fin soup. Uh, and so there's been some really fantastic work, but there's a, a lot of work to still be done, which is why it's important to have broadcasts like this. Um, Julia, we're going to take two more questions before we make sure our classes have the resources to keep the learning going. So Ms. Corbett's class first, and Ms. Katron will wrap up. Hi. <laughs> what is the most cool and, the coolest encounter that you have made with a shark? The coolest encounter? We've got another version of this. you got to give us one. <laughs> Uh, I think the coolest encounter was probably in the Red Sea swimming with groups of whale sharks um, wow. because they are so big and seeing so many of them at, at the same time and being able to swim with them sometimes for hours, um, that's that's pretty special. And um, you, you almost feel like you have a connection to these sharks because they just swim with you and you follow them and yeah they're just great i can only recommend it if you ever get a chance to snorkel with whale sharks you should definitely do it there's a few places in the world that people can so mexico is a little closer to some of our u.s classes and canadian classes today but red sea we've had australian people diving with whale sharks madagascar and so uh, yeah it's that they're, they really are a, a quite special creature on this planet uh, Miss Cottrell's class, one more from you guys, and we'll wrap up from there. Come on in, everybody. Hi. Hi. If sharks are older than dinosaurs, then are they dinosaurs? Then could they be dinosaurs? Yeah. 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 Sorry, if sharks are older than dinosaurs, I appreciate that you're both trying to do it at the same time. So if sharks are older than dinosaurs, did they ever interact or eat them? Is that the question, or what's the... Now, if sharks are older than dinosaurs, then could they be actually dinosaurs? Could they be dinosaurs? Ah, that's actually a good question. Um, but no, they're not really dinosaurs. So, um, I mean, I can't explain to you the exact difference, I have to admit. Yeah. Well, I can dive in here. Just, just like today, you know, we've got reptiles, we've got mammals, we've got birds, we've got amphibians, different groups of animals. Dinosaur is a term that a lot of people now apply to anything that it used to exist in the world. But dinosaurs are actually a very specific group of animals, just like we wouldn't call a chimpanzee a reptile. It's a mammal. And so dinosaurs were quite unique. We had things like sharks. We had things that also don't exist anymore, like pterosaurs are also not dinosaurs, the big flying reptiles, not actually in the dinosaur group. Dinosaur is much more of a technical term for a group of animals that were related. Uh, but sharks actually predated them, as we said, by almost double. So that's our, our sort of broad answer. Uh, it's not a generalized term for everything that existed back in that time period. But very cool question, guys. Right <laughs> Julia, this has been so much fun. I know we can talk about sharks all day, and so I want to make sure, again, our kids know the Padlet link. I'll get this to all our registered groups if you want to share any additional questions, or you can email or uh, reach out to Julia on Twitter. She wants to take your questions in all the ways, really. You can just yell across the ocean if you want to, <laughs> and see if it comes to her. Uh, but I also encourage you to check out the amazing resources she did in partnership with Conservation Optimism, our partner in this broadcast series. Incredible stuff to keep learning going about sharks. And in general, check them out. Check out our friends at the IUCN Green List. And if you want to learn more about whale sharks in particular, tomorrow we continue with Gonzo Araju, uh, as well as some other programs on bison, coral, and tigers to come. Julia, um, thank you so much for joining us today. What we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teacher friends to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Mr. Rand, Ms. Corbett, Ms. Cottrell's class, come on in and join me in saying thanks and goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.